The astronomer's tool of choice is the telescope. So in this section, we're going to take a look at how telescopes work in general and how they are applied for use in astronomy in particular. The first astronomer to ever use the telescope was Galileo. At least that's how he marketed himself. Uh, he was almost certainly not the first person to ever point the telescope up to the stars, but his observations did revolutionize our view of the cosmos. Nevertheless, the telescopes that he, were, he was using were really primitive spyglasses by uh, today's standards. On the right are the actual telescopes that Galileo used. Uh, he built them himself. And on the left is a you know, three-dimensional uh, CGI reproduction of what that telescope looked like. So this type of telescope is called a refracting telescope. The first part of the refracting telescope is obviously the lens, which has a special name. It's called the objective lens. So typically this is a convex lens that's going to bend or refract the light uh, along its edges while letting the light kind of pass through the middle unimpeded. Uh, the diameter of the objective is referred to as the aperture. We usually symbolize that with the uh, uppercase letter D. And if we had, let's say, a distant star, uh, then all of the star's light would be coming through the lens initially in parallel. However, because the light refracts more at the edges, they will eventually converge to form an image. And the point at which it forms the image is called the focus. Therefore, the distance from the objective to the focus is called the focal length. So what is the purpose of the objective? Well, it's simply to capture more light than the eye can produce and therefore producing a brighter image. Now we've already shown that brightness drops by one over the distance squared. So the more distant an object is, the fainter it's going to be. Therefore, a large aperture objective can gather that much more light and form a brighter image. And this is particularly useful for stars, which are very dim compared to everyday objects that we look at during the daytime. Now, in order to inspect this image, we need to employ a second lens. Uh, this is commonly known as an eyepiece. And what this does is it lets the light rays uh, spread apart once again and then focuses them into an image. So it basically magnifies the image and allows the eye to actually see the image produced by the objective. So the eyepiece is also going to have its own focal length. And therefore, the ratio of the two focal lengths, the ratio of the objective's focal length to the eyepiece's focal length, is what we refer to as the magnification. Now, if you think about the way light behaves when it passes through any medium, it typically will disperse into its component colors. And the same effect happens here. So here's a really simple or oversimplified version of looking at somebody through a refracting telescope. So light rays are going to reflect off of the individual and they're going to pass through the objective. But in so doing, they are refracted by different amounts. And so different colors form images at different focal lengths from the objective. But it's even worse than that because you can't focus on all three of these images simultaneously. You have to pick one color and then let the rest just blur out. So this is a phenomenon known as chromatic aberration. And if you ever use a lens that does not have any corrective elements in it, then you're going to see uh, this effect in action. So here's a weather vane. Uh, we could see colors just spilling everywhere. In order to fix this problem, most refracting telescopes are fitted with what are called achromatic lenses, or sometimes called compound lenses. Simply, they introduce a second lens element that has the effect of rebending or re-refracting the shorter wavelength light such that all the focal lengths of all of the different component colors of light converge once again, forming a nice cl clear image. In fact, you can obtain the sharpest images this way. However, we are employing more glass to produce the image, and every time you let light pass through some glass, you're going to lose a few photons here and there. So depending upon your application, you may or may not want to lose those extra photons. Still, you can get the sharpest images this way. In fact, I got to use a telescope of this very same configuration uh, when I was working at the Sproul Observatory at Swarthmore College uh, back when I was a kid. Um, you can see here just how big the observatory, the, the enclosure, needs to be in order to accommodate this telescope. This telescope has an aperture of 24 inches, about two feet, which is 
by today's standards, not very large for an astronomical telescope. And yet, despite having a rather modest aperture, it had to be enclosed in a building that had more cubic volume than the house I grew up in. So here we have a telescope with a rather long focal length, and we don't have any way of shortcutting that focal length. It needs to travel all the way through that tube in order to come to a focus before it goes into the camera at the bottom of the picture. So you are stuck with a very large building to accommodate a rather modest-sized refracting telescope. Remember, these lenses have to be supported by their edges. Therefore, you can't put anything behind the lens to keep it upright or else you're going to block light. So anything beyond uh, about a meter in diameter and the lens will start to just sag underneath its own weight and become useless. So refracting telescopes have several fundamental disadvantages, uh, not the least of which is chromatic aberration. Uh, then you have to build them very long uh, for modest apertures. That in turn requires very large structures in order to house them. The lenses are very heavy and they are very difficult and therefore very expensive to produce. Now the problems with refractors were well known as far back as Isaac Newton's time and Newton himself developed a alternative method of building telescopes, this time using mirrors instead of lenses. And so the reflecting telescope operates this way. There is a primary mirror, and just like we saw with the refracting telescope, its diameter is the aperture. So the light reflects off of the primary mirror. You notice that the primary mirror is concave in shape. This allows the light to come to a focus. And at this point, we could make an image except for one problem, and that is if we were to place our eyes there, then the rest of our head will block out the incoming light. So what Newton did is he just set up a 45-degree mirror called a secondary mirror and redirected the light out the side of the telescope's tube. You place an eyepiece there, and now you have uh, a nice uh, focused image, and now you're not blocking out any light. A problem with Newtonian reflecting telescopes, though, if you're going to build a telescope with this particular configuration, is that you may be running into a potential safety hazard if you built a telescope with a long focal length mirror. So you got to be a little careful in situations like this. There's an alternative configuration that astronomers like to use, and it's called the Cassegrain reflector. So rather than use a 45 degree flat mirror, a secondary mirror is set up that is convex in shape. And what this does is it redirects the light out through a donut hole cut in the back of the primary mirror. Now, this donut hole does mean that we're going to lose some of the light. But this also means that the telescope's focal length effectively gets folded up into thirds. So we can have a telescope that is much more compact, even though it could have a potentially nice long focal length. So there are three main types of reflecting telescopes. There is the Newtonian design that we talked about before. Uh, there's also the prime telescope or the prime focus telescope. If you can get a camera small enough relative to the mirror, you could fit it there at the prime focus and not obstruct too much light. Or you can use what most uh, research telescopes use, and that is the Cassegrain design. In fact, at Towson University, where I teach, uh, we use a telescope of this particular configuration. And the great thing about these reflectors is that there are so many advantages to them. Uh, mirrors are a lot easier to manufacture and therefore cheaper than lenses. You can build the mirrors uh, thinner and therefore they're a, lot, they're a lot lighter than lenses. So it's, it requires less stuff to hold the mirror up. You can also support the mirror on the sides and even from behind. And because they're cheaper, you can build them larger. As a matter of fact, they won't sag under their own weight very much. Uh, so you can even build them well beyond one meter in aperture. Mirrors don't even suffer from chromatic aberration. So you don't need to introduce any extra lenses or mirrors in order to correct for a problem that simply does not exist. And best of all, using the Cassegrain design, you can fold up that focal length and therefore you can get a large aperture and a long focal length in a relatively small package. So you could see my colleague, Dr. Alex Storrs, uh, behind uh, the, the desk there inside the observatory. Yeah, you could tell that this is a pretty uh, cozy environment, but here we have a 
0.4 meter or a 16 inch Cassegrain reflector uh, nicely compact and put into a relatively small observatory.